morning, everyone that's joining. We'll just watch it. the numbers tick up a tiny bit more and then we'll make a start. Morning, Xerxes. So nice to see your face. <laughs> OK, I suggest we make a start so we don't uh, lose any more time. Morning, everybody. I'm uh, Rebecca Bailey, the Programme Director of Towards a National Collection. And I'm really just topping and tailing uh, the event today and have the very glamorous task of talking you through the uh, Zoom rules for the day. Um, so during the presentations, if everybody, I think the default now is that your mics are switched off, but you can turn them back on for the presenters and for anyone that's called in to ask a question later. Um, for everybody's bandwidth, once we get going with the presentations, it's probably best to turn your cameras off. Um, we're going to have uh, the three presentations back to back and then have a single Q&A session referring to all three presentations, particularly to allow if people have questions that they want to address to more than one of the presenters. But what you can do, of course, is during the presentations, use the chat function to record your questions or record your desire to ask a question. It's helpful if you say the subject matter. Carlotta, our researcher, um, she's in my top corner, so I'm waving at her, um, is going to try and corral the questions. So if people are asking similar things, she'll try and group them together. And for some questions, particularly if you're being a bit trickier, we will call on you to switch on your camera and ask your question yourself. Um, I hope that sounds okay for everyone. Um, we're super, super grateful to have our speakers here today. Carlotta is going to introduce them, but I just wanted to give my personal thanks because they're all in the other half of the world. Um, so they're in a very different time zone for us. Uh, it's not too bad in Japan, but our friends in New Zealand have stayed up very late to talk to us. So we're very, very grateful. Although they have just been telling us what COVID is like in New Zealand and um, we're feeling a bit jealous now. So I'm gonna hand over uh, to Carlotta, who's going to explain the rationale behind our new seminar series and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's quite a turnout. We're very happy. Uh, I'm Carlotta Paltrinieri, and I am TANG, so Towards the National Collection, abbreviated uh, senior researcher. And I will very briefly introduce you to the series and to our speakers today. So the idea behind this series is to hear from projects around the world that have been successful at building a national collection that links digital objects from different institutions across what we call the glam sector, and that could inspire Tang's mission. So this series is itself part of a larger benchmark review on international initiatives that are relevant to Tank in scope, in scale, and in impact. So today we have the honor to listen to two excellent examples of a virtual national collection and listening to their experience in best practice across all areas. So technology, engagement, inclusivity, and openness and will surely be beneficial to us and to our audience today and in the future. So we will hear first from Fiona Fieldsend, the director of Digital NZ, and Mark Ruxton, program director of the Documentary Heritage at the National Library of New Zealand who will tell us more about the incredible Digital NZ and their projects for the future. And then we will hear from Professor Akihiko Takano, Chair of the Practitioner Review Committee of Japan Search, who will present the great achievement of Japan Search. And I will stop now and give the floor to Fiona. So thank you again to everyone and to our speakers today. Kia Koto, I will just get screen sharing and take it away. Okay, hopefully that's all looking right. Colin, let me know if it isn't. Uh, I will get started unless I hear from you. Tēnā koutou e nā āhuatanga o te wā. Ko Fiona Fielding tako ingoa, ke te puna maturanga o Aotearoa āhua e mahi ana. Hei, kāpa kai whakarari, matihiko, fiha, fiako. 
no reda tenakoto tenakoto katoa. Kia ora, I'm Fiona Fields and I'm the Director of Digital Experience at National Library of New Zealand. And, um, and that was my, my um, mihi, it gives you a little bit of a sense of where I come from and also the importance of te reo, the, the language of the Māori culture in New Zealand. But today I'm here to share the journey we are taking in Aotearoa New Zealand to help make New Zealand content easy to find, share and use and how we've tried to dissolve barriers between different collections, opening New Zealand heritage to New Zealand and to the world. So it's quite a similar goal, um, and I copied some of your goals there, but trying to make some connections across the way. Digital New Zealand Atihi or Aotearoa kicked off with much fanfare back in 2008 with the tagline of helping make New Zealand content easier to find, share and use. It was an, a project initially funded out of the 2007 Digital Content Strategy, which had the subheading of Creating a Digital New Zealand. This was the partner strategy to the then New Zealand Digital Strategy. It was recognised that it was all very well developing a digital infrastructure for our nation, but there needed to be investment into what actually fills the pipes and what people need to interact with. The funding for Digital New Zealand back then aimed to set up the ongoing infrastructure to deliver exemplars that demonstrate what is possible when there is a concerted effort to improve access and discovery of New Zealand content. It was, and we took what we dubbed a test lab approach. We identified and worked on potential solutions to some of the many issues that prevent access, use and discovery of New Zealand digital content. We're a small country um, in a big world and finding New Zealand content was challenging. And boy, did we go ahead and build some ex exemplars back then to show what was possible. Of course, we built a search across a very wide number of collections from the glam sector and beyond. But core to that was what we believe was the world's first culture and heritage open API. This enabled us to build things like widgets that people could embed um, uh, collection searches on their blogs and websites and we worked with developers on what was then a new thing visualizations of what different visualizations of what collections look like and we also had a go at a collaborative remix showcase uh, which was an example of us trying to show what was possible when you could free the licensing of publicly available content for reuse and remixing and back then it was the first time many of the glam institutions in New Zealand had tried opening up their the content for reuse, it was a new thing and it was a bit of a mind shift back then. The programme also explored policy and capability exemplars, so looking at ways for us to improve access to advice around digital standards, formats and protocols. We had a dra draft framework to help organisations prioritise content for digitisation and we even ran a public tool for people out in the public to vote for the content that they wanted glam sector to digitize. We also published best practice guidance, guidance on creating digital content, uh, which included flow charts on identifying public domain materials and on how to work out copyright expiry. This was what became the Make It Digital service, which is still around today and remains a very popular part of our service, if a little under-resourced right now. However, our core and fundamental achievement was enabling search across multiple organizations' collections. You know, that world's first culture and heritage open API, we like to have world first here in little old New Zealand. And this remains core, the core of digital New Zealand today. We're enabling metadata aggregation and making that data available for reuse and use to improve discovery, bringing together New Zealand Aotearoa content so it's easy to find in one place. Back then though, we hardly anyone in the glam sector knew what an API was. And one of our biggest challenges was convincing our content partners that it was a good idea to let people use their data. One of our key success factors back then, and still actually, is that we made it as easy as possible to participate. We've designed our metadata harvesting technology so that we do all the heavy lifting. We're able to work with almost any kind of metadata it just needs to have a title and a persistent, persistent URL. And if we hadn't have done this back then, we wouldn't have got the uptake back in 2008. And actually we wouldn't be man, maintain, maintaining the scale that we're at now. So we're able to work with a very wide range of metadata quality and we're open to that 
in order to get the participation and the content connected and, and easier to find. We also made the particip participation terms as simple as we could and clear. Um, and this was all before CC0 and the concept of open data release. In some ways, we were a bit too early in that respect because we've, we've put um, some terms over the data use that, that maybe we wouldn't have done if we'd waited a year or two and worked up with CC0 and other options. So now we have over 200 content partners and well over 30 million items and the team is growing that every day. We also have a range of services that use the API to enhance content discovery. And we've also made our data aggregation infrastructure open source so that others can use it. An example of people using the API, this is Seismic, the University of Canterbury and Christchurch um, used the Digital New Zealand API to bring together content related to the Canterbury earthquakes. And it's powered by Digital New Zealand. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the National Library of New Zealand's collection search is also powered by our search infrastructure. Which brings me to a small plug for Supplejack. This is the open source metadata aggregation and discovery management tool that we have. So if you happen to have uh, disparate data sets of metadata that uh, you want to aggregate and bring together, well, we've got the open source product for you. That infrastructure has made it possible for us to build digitalpacific.org in the last year. This is an initiative that is bringing together digital items by, for, and about Pacific people. And we're really proud of this initiative. It was co-designed with Pacific people over the lockdown we had here in New Zealand, so completely online. And um, importantly, it, it was completely collaborative and built in collaboration with National Library of Australia and funded by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and all built on digital New Zealand infrastructure. But back to DNZ, Digital New Zealand and where we are now. Over the years, our investment has not been as generous as the heyday of 2008 and, and the early years. Digital New Zealand is now a small agile team who focus on the aggregation of digital content metadata and making that as easy as possible for people to connect, connect to New Zealand digital content and to also make the user experience, to use user experience approaches to build new ways to experience and interact with that content. So an example is the way we try to use accessible and informal language to describe um, and present the content in the search interface, as well as helping, it, helping people to understand license, licensing and rights and making it as easy as possible for them to know how they can use the content that they, can, they discover. So an example is this traffic light system. So this one is all green, but of course, if something had restrictions, you would be seeing reds and then accessible language describing, about, describing what you can be doing with it. As well as that, we develop stories so that people can bring together items of interest to them from across the many content partners collections that they've discovered through the Digital New Zealand search. Uh, so this is an example of a publisher here in New Zealand bringing together content that appeared in a particular book about the Treaty of Waitangi. We make it possible in the stories interface for people to build their own narrative to add titles and captions um, and, and to enhance the story around the collection items that they've discovered. Just recently, we've built an upload. So people are able to now upload their personal items to into the story interface and, 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 and make the connections between the collection items of the glam sector and beyond because we also work with um, organizations beyond the glam sector because New Zealand content is in a lot of places um, with their own, their own items. And um, this is an example. So you, what you're actually seeing is the very first pavlova I made back in 2018. But this long story hasn't really taken us, I don't think, to where you're all aspiring to go. DNZ has not taken Aotearoa very far towards a national collection, I don't, I don't think, certainly in my mind, in what I think the definition of national collection is. We make it easier to discover New Zealand content in one go, but with the crunching of our funding over the years, what's dissolved away is that innovation, that test lab, 
lab approach that I was talking about before, and we have a necessary focus on BAU, on aggregation, keeping the service going and improving the experience while amplifying access to the digital content. But what I can say is we are talking more at the National Library about what the next stage in digital and content strategy might look like. What are the technical digital policy and capability platforms that we could be collaborating on across the sector so that New Zealanders will easily access, share and use New Zealand's knowledge resources. That slide there is um, coming from the National Library of New Zealand strategy um, to 2030, which has three pillars around Taonga or collections and looking after them well, reading and their knowledge and how can we connect people to the information they need to create new knowledge and innovate. So we're working on something and we'll keep in touch on how that's going but um, I think it's time for my colleague Mark to talk a little bit more about broader strategic work around collecting and the documentary heritage strategy. So that's me. I look forward to interacting with you later and you're welcome to contact me if you have any specific questions after the session. Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Mark Crookston tako ingoa. Um, my name is Mark Crookston. I am the Programme Director of Documentary Heritage at the National Library of New Zealand. Um, it's um, part of my role is um, to um, look to try and bring the documentary heritage sort of sector together, uh, establish some national priorities and um, understand the interventions that can take place at a, at a national, regional or local level that can have a multiplier effect somewhere else and across the sector. So how do, we, how do we pull everything together to make sure collectively we're doing the right thing so that New Zealand's knowledge can be created, the right stuff is being created, it can be documented, it can be um, found in the right kind of repositories, not necessarily the national ones, um, um, and, and used. So, um, it's a great it's a great job title. I've only been in it for a, a few months, but I'm here to tell you about some of the context of why this role was created, um, um, uh, a, a little bit about sort of the intention that we have and some of the approaches that we're taking both in the in the National Library, but sort of more broadly about um, moving towards this idea of a of a national collection. So I hope it's of interest to um, whatever your project is for all you listening, but um, already just looking at the Towards the National Collection project, I think there's some quite um, uh, very close similarities to what our thinking, our, our initial thinking is in New Zealand and, and, and the journey that you guys are embarking on. So this notion of national and what is it really? Um, I'd like to bring together a, a, a few threads here. The first is in terms of New Zealand, some basic demographics. Um, the most recent census 2018 stated that there were um, about 70% of uh, New Zealanders were of European descent, uh, about 17% uh, uh, indigenous Maori, 13% uh, Asian, 9% Pacific, um, that equals more than 100, but um, uh, they haven't released yet the, um, the, the youth figures from that census. So I'm pulling these stats from, um, from the 2013 census in New Zealand. Of um, zero to 14 year olds, um, over 30% identified as, uh, I think it was 32% identified as uh, Pacific, 31% uh, uh, indigenous Maori, 20% um, Asian, and uh, about 14% of zero to 14 year olds in New Zealand were of European descent. So you can see we're in the middle of this really significant shift in demography uh, that will, within about, a gener within about a generation, kind of fundamentally change who New Zealand is and the lens, lens through which we uh, view and understand culture and identity. Um, the second part of is, is sort of an, an analysis of our existing collections. 
Um, we know that for collecting institutions of documentary heritage, the predominant source of those collections is through um, donation from individuals or interest groups in New Zealand. So some analysis of, of, of our donors and our donation program and the collections that have come from that within the National Library of New Zealand concluded most donations came from women of European descent. Most of those uh, collections were about men, um, um, which mostly came through women as well. Um, most collections about uh, the Pacific, which is a mandated collection focus of the library. And I'll talk a bit more about our collection focuses later. Most collections about the Pacific are documenting experiences of people of European descent in the Pacific or views or of views of um, Pacific people from the perspective of European descent. So diaries, photos, et cetera, that have been, that have been taken um, by Europeans. And that the collections that document the experience of recent migrants in New Zealand, i.e. about the last, sort of last 20 years, are virtually non-existent in the National Library of New Zealand. And um, I've been talking with colleagues up and down the country and asking the question is, on uh, the extent to which uh, that analysis of the collections holds true for theirs as well, and 100% uh, yes. Um, so there's that as well. We know that the collections are biased and that there's huge gaps, especially in relation to who we are and who we're going to be in New Zealand. We also know that for people, uh, communities or organizations that aren't already aware of or believe in collecting institutions, there's usual, usually considerable gaps in time between when uh, relationships can be established with prospective donors or people donating material and the actual collection items coming to the library. Um, there's some practical reasons for that, but mostly that's about trust and the time that it takes to build up trust um, in order for uh, people to donate collections about who they are, who their family is, what their organization is, who their interest group is and their community is to a collecting institution. So in short, um, New Zealand is changing significantly. The national collections uh, does not reflect um, New Zealand now. Um, and uh, we're at great risk for it not reflecting New Zealand at all. Um, not at all, but not reflecting New Zealand significantly uh, in the future. And it's going to take a considerable sustained effort to establish the relationships, create awareness and build trust um, in what collecting institutions are in order to start developing a national collection that reflects New Zealand as a nation. So why is this important? This is some of the things that we've been discussing with our colleagues. If preservation and access to documentary heritage delivers a range of social, economic and cultural benefits including supporting social cohesion through visibility recognition and inclusion in uh, national narratives then not being part of the national collection is a mechanism of division of marginalizing and uh, disengagement in national narratives um, my colleague said this the other day uh, she said imagining opening your family photo album only to find no image of yourself so for me, a national collection enables some way for all New Zealanders to see themselves in the concept of who or what New Zealand is. There's a couple of um, legislative and policy settings, which I think um, might be quite interesting to, to, to colleagues that are driving some of, the, um, some of the shifts in thinking in New Zealand at the moment. From a legislative perspective, the National Library of New Zealand Act um, positions the library in a leadership role not just for us, but across the country. There's only three purposes of the National Library. One is about collecting, preserving, and protecting and making accessible um, uh, documents, particularly those relating to New Zealand and uh, making them accessible for all the people of New Zealand. Um, and one of the other ones is working collaboratively with institutions of, with similar purposes. And we've done um, uh, an okay job in uh, acquiring and collecting and uh, preserving and providing access to collections, but um, the working collaboratively with other institutions with similar purposes has not really been um, intentionally worked on since the 2008 digital strategy that, uh, that Fiona mentioned. And so um, there's a bit of momentum building up now to um, get the band back together and to start heading in, the, in that direction again. Several years ago, we significantly adjusted our, our collection policy settings at the National Library. Um, uh, 
um, in order to, to, to position the library um, as, as, as a leader and coordinator of national collections. Not that we would be telling people what to be doing, but um, we now have this principle that the library is an important, plays an important leadership role in collaborating and coordinating collection related activities. It's on the slide there, you can, you can read it. But I mean, that, that used to say that we, we make decisions that are aware of the collecting priorities of other institutions. But now we say the role is more about um, coordinating and leading and collaborating with others. So it's a really quite a powerful instruction to staff to just not collect and know what's going on, but to actively participate and collaborate. And um, that's sort of progressed to mixed success across the library, I would say. There's some really strong areas where it's really taken off. I um, mean, I'll talk about a couple of them. And there's other areas where we're still sort of uh, working across the system to, to build the, the right priorities for, for acquisition and collecting. But the policy settings also outlined um, priorities. Um, and the priorities are designed to focus on building a national collection. So identifying the gaps that are in a national collection and proactively going about addressing them. And so um, it listed a whole lot of areas where the, the library is uh, strong and it has collection strengths. And it still said that they are important to us, but that they wouldn't be actively sought. It then outlined a whole lot of what we called proactive priorities. And they're the ones where um, we're trying to marshal our resource into proactively establishing the relationships and documenting um, uh, in order to document um, those gaps, some of those gaps of uh, in, the, in the National Documentary Heritage Estate to better understand who we are and document who we are as a, uh, as, as a country. Um, in changing some of those priorities, we've had to have some quite difficult conversations with um, donors who um, would expect the National Library to um, acquire their material and uh, we are not doing that anymore. And uh, we're getting better at having some of those conversations and we're also getting a bit better at um, articulating uh, what we collect and why. But there's always more improvement to happen there. But a couple of recent interventions just within the library or collection priorities that I'll touch on now as examples. Um, we focused on a couple of areas um, to get some success straight away, mostly um, focused on digital and using our web archiving and digital archiving um, capability. Um, so the web offers quite a, um, a great opportunity to document parts of New Zealand society that, um, or parts of any society really, that, um, that, that wouldn't necessarily be heard as part of the normal physical and analog process of packaging up collections and, and, and bringing them to a collecting institution. So we all know about Facebook. In New Zealand, about 65% uh, of the country has a Facebook account. Um, Facebook is both the realization of the magnificent promise of the social web, the bringing together of the communities, the creating of communities, et cetera, but it also has a, has a dark side. Um, those big social media platforms, they're not neutral. Um, they're designed to shape our thinking. Uh, they're designed to uh, shape who we connect with and how we define our communities, the spreaders of misinformation and hate as well. So we've noticed a lot of people leaving Facebook recently. So we created this option for people to download their personal archive and to um, make it part of the, of, of the national collection so that we can better um, um, document, A, Facebook as a phenomenon in New Zealand, but also some of those stories and communities that have, um, that have arisen as, as part of, um, or arisen on Facebook. Um, the emphasis here is on um, donation. So we've provided a whole lot of tools to enable people to download their own uh, archive and they can either keep it for themselves and we um, provide some support for how they might do that or instruction, but also then they can donate it to us and they've got um, three access restrictions that they can um, that they can choose from. One is just uh, access within a reading room of the National Library. The other is restrict for 25 years and then make open and the final one is restrict for 100 years and then make open. Most people are choosing uh, making open within a re reading room or the 25 year restriction. Uh, 
Um, the National Library of New Zealand is also home to the New Zealand Cartoon Archive. Its focus was traditionally editorial cartoons, but we've recently um, refocused that to be uh, cartoons and comics and have deliberately scoped it to be a mechanism to better document communities that have little representation in our collection and in the national collection. Um, here's some representations of beneficiaries in the Cartoon Archive. Um, uh, editorial cartoons uh, relating to beneficiaries are predominantly um, um, uh, amplifiers of stereotypes or racism. Um, and uh, that's very much so in the New Zealand Cartoon Archive. But um, we've recently um, worked with this um, community, uh, which is a, a sort of a hashtag community that, 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 that um, um, that came together on Twitter and Instagram uh, called We Are The Beneficiaries. And it was a response to some political stuff going on in New Zealand. But um, predominantly there are um, artists and illustrators, cartoonists and comic artists, et cetera, who um, drew and wrote about their life on the, on the benefit. And um, these are stories, these are very, very powerful stories, very personal stories that, uh, that um, are just not documented anywhere else. I mean, there's, yeah, they're just not documented in the in the national collections. And so we worked with the organisers of this um, of this community to ensure that uh, everybody's story who was included in this archive um, gave permission for us to um, to collect it. Another area of focus um, in our shift in collection policy was around um, areas of popular culture that are not part of the national narrative. Um, uh, independent music is written about a lot, but um, there's very little in the way of um, archiving function for the independent music scene in New Zealand. So we changed the New Zealand Music Archive that's based at the National Library of New Zealand to have a focus on popular music. And really we decided, to, we positioned ourselves as the archive of the independent music scene. So this is Roger Shepherd from the Flying Nun Records label in uh, New Zealand, and if you haven't heard of them, I recommend you find uh, an album by The Clean and have a listen. Um, and um, this is the third independent music label where we have um, they've donated the entire um, master tape archive to us, and we're digitizing that, putting that online, and um, enabling the label to and the bands to reissue from that. Um, three things that are kind of like shifting the focus of what the library does. I should say that with the um, Facebook project, we are working with other collecting institutions so that they can um, work with their communities to identify uh, Facebook accounts that, that we can collect. So it's not just, um, it's kind of like a national effort. It's not just something that the National Library are doing. Um, but really we're trying to like shift it up at a national level. And I realize I've got a half finished sentence here at a bullet point. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap that up. Um, that's what we're doing. But at the same time, part of my role is to um, try and make this, um, this work at a national level. So um, better um, um, put in place the mechanisms by which New Zealand documentary heritage institutions or the glam sector with documentary heritage at its core um, can understand common challenges, come together for um, uh, with strategies, with priorities that marshal the resources together for us to address some of the some of the common challenges and needs. And here's what's emerging from some of those conversations at the moment. Um, what to prioritize for collecting? We're thinking of um, some, some national prioritization sort of framework. Training and capability building around developing national collections, especially uh, especially born digital collections. And there's a little bit of work going on there um, with some training suites that we are, we, are, we are giving across the country, but it's some sustained effort and probably funding is required there. Digitization priorities um, around from the 2008 digital strategy that Fiona spoke about, um, still very much something that um, across the country people are wanting more guidance on and kind of a shared understanding of. Digital infrastructure. Fiona spoke about Digital New Zealand, but there's a couple of key other pieces of digital infrastructure that are um, where investment 
from uh, galleries, museums, libraries, archives, community groups, et cetera, around the country. The, the, the funding of it, um, the funding required to do that at an institutional or community level is, is prohibited. So we're looking at, at, at how we can best um, um, pool or marshal some national funding around that. That's things like digital preservation platforms, um, improvements to digital New Zealand, um, thinking about a non-digital New Zealand. So um, um, would something like digital New Zealand, as Fiona said, it's not necessarily a national collection. It's a national collection of things digitized in New Zealand. Um, but there's a lot of non-digitized uh, items in New Zealand. So what would a, a national catalog of documentary heritage in New Zealand look like, for example? Um, there's a lot of policy work to do as well. Um, policy, um, uh, policy around copyright, policy around reuse, policy around data sovereignty, um, et cetera, that's starting to come to come out as a priority. But most importantly, I think um, uh, what we've got to focus on is, is, is rebuilding the culture of collaboration and coordination across New Zealand. Um, Fiona spoke about 2008. It really was a, a coming together of, of, of the sector in New Zealand and some really beautiful, amazing things were developed from that. But the kind of, the, the, I guess it's kind of been years of austerity, <laughs> I would put it down to mostly, um, has meant that quite a lot of our sector is sort of um, uh, entrenched back into its institutional corner. And um, now we've got to um, understand each other again. We've got to learn who each other, is again and what our priorities are and how we work and come together to, to find the common goals and to really build that culture of collaboration. Um, so we've really only just started embarking on this journey. Um, it's sort of towards a national collection, but it's, it's, it's more, it's sort of towards a, a national system of documentary heritage that ensures that um, the, the right things are, are uh, preserved, um, they're protected, they're made accessible and they're able to be used and they're delivering value to New Zealand. So that's the journey that we've sort of started embarking on in, uh, again in New Zealand and that's part of my role. And so I, I look at the Toward a National Collection Project in the UK with um, 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 I, th I think you're just a couple of steps ahead of me. So um, that's great if you could continue to do so, because then I can learn from you as, as, as we build something similar in New Zealand. That's it from me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to go on to now our next speaker, if you'd like to share your screen, Professor. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Akihiko Takano from National Institute of Informatics in Tokyo. And today I'd like to introduce a brief introduction about the, our new service, Japan Search, which has uh, officially kicked off uh, last August. But before that, we have uh, one, one year and a half uh, pre-open pre period. And today I will use uh, slides which are from the development team from, of uh, National Diet, from National Diet Library. Yeah, these are their names. So let's start. So what is Japan Search? And uh, the Japan Search is designed to pro provide a platform for metadata on, of various content from GLAM institutes in Japan. The library has many books and manuscripts, museums by the cultural assets, picture of cultural assets or artworks, and the National Archive uh, provide uh, collection of metadata uh, of official documents and maps and etc. And the universities, of course, uh, provide some kind of academic resources, which are um, good for specialists and not for 
not necessarily be for uh, the public, uh, general public. But we, we try to provide the platform for collecting the old metadata of those uh, institutes and the, create a new, ty new type of um, function for them. So our goals are uh, how to enable a one-stop discovery service within Japan. And the, we also try to clarify secondary use conditions, which are not always uh, clear from even from the established institute. So by collecting those uh, metadata information together with those uh, conditions for reuse, uh, the, the activities which we, uh, we use all, all these informations uh, will be uh, will be activated, I believe. So the, as a result, the collection of those uh, metadata can be uh, distributed as a volume, volume set of uh, information, what kind of uh, digital information we are actually use, use uh, for various activities. So we hope these uh, goals will promote the innovative use of these digital content in Japan. So who we are. Uh, Japan Search is a governmental activities uh, with a cross-sectoral project. So many ministries are get together and support those activities. Not by budget, but for maybe spirits in, at, at this moment. And the, so J, JPS administration policy is established by this, the government found committee and the underlying that committee, uh, there is a practitioner reviewing committee, which is a collection of uh, practitioner uh, from all different John of our digital archives. Uh, I am a chair of this uh, practitioner committee. So uh, I, I'm not today, I'm here. I'm not a member of the National Diet Library, but um, I know the, a lot of their policy. Actually, we discuss, we have discussed much of those uh, collection policies or the service policy together with um, the uh, people. The system itself, Japan search system itself has been developed by National Diet Library and the, they are responsible for operating as a service. Uh, it, National Diet Library can spare the 15 staff members, which are collected from five different uh, branches, sections within National Diet Library. And the, they spend much their times to create this service. And the, all these uh, uh, necessary budget is from National Diet Libraries right now. And the, here's a short history of the development of our, uh, of this uh, Japan search. Should almost four years ago, uh, 2017, April, we started this discussion about uh, what kind of uh, activities we should design to for the for promote the activities around the digital archives within this country, within Japan. And so after some hard discussions, uh, JPS uh, Japan Search Project is uh, actually born and the NDL picked that, take that responsibility for creating the prototype of that. And we released the prototype service in 2019, February. And after one year and a half, we officially launched the service. And the, so in, in Japan, 
the each ministry is i i don't know about the other country but the, at least uh, at least in japan the each ministry has uh, tried to keep their land and they never uh, join and create uh, this kind of um, project so this times we are lucky uh, to have uh, this uh, kind of high rather high level committee which are urge us to to create the new project okay so the for design of the japan search system uh, we insist to keep these three principles so first one is do not assume a fixed format for 100 metadata because the scope of japan search is is very from library to museums and official documents from national archives so it is not easy to assume the one uh, common format for all of those data so we try to use a rather flexible metadata uh, handling uh, to realize that uh, later i will explain it in a little more detail second one is um, as a service we want to deliver a uh, attractive one so quick response is uh, crucial and flexible search function is also necessary of course we cannot compete with uh, google or that kind of gafa uh, services but the considering the collection of the quality of the collected information we can we we i hope we will have a land to compete with them the third one is uh, advanced technical requirements which we try to um, use uh, modern technology or the modern uh, requirements we try to satisfy so for example the mobile first approach or browser support is uh, should be should be necessary and the, we want to care about the uh, triple if which is now becoming a de facto standard for international uh, exchange of image things and the sna support is uh, of course necessary and multilingual support which is not uh, which is not trivial in case of japan but we insist to deliver it at least uh, English, Jap English and Japanese. And the API is, of course, we need to provide and search engine optimization. We need to not only a search function, but also a, a kind of um, gener generated content, uh, which looks, which should be looked, should be seen attractive from the search engine or the users and accessibility in universal accessibility is necessary to consider and and of course uh, we have to be prepared for linked open data approach so we provide the contents as a ldf summary and so so the system itself has uh, these four uh, components but today i want to be i want to dive into detail of those uh, technical things uh, but later i will tell you some okay to to realize this we need to collect connect all these participant participating institute and the collect metadata and the junk into our service and so we we borrow the similar approach as europeana so here's a diagram which we are using so participant uh, institute provide the metadata but not individually but um, we ask some group of uh, those uh, participants create some commu community to discuss about what kind of uh, 
metadata structure should be proper for that um, area. And the, all, from these um, aggregators, we receive the collected metadata. But of course, uh, there are not, um, not all participants can be grouped up. So of course we are, we also pick some independent uh, participants uh, for, for joining us. And the, these are the infrastructure and the utilization layer. The Japan search collects all these information and the somehow cooked the metadata in more, more usable way and provide a service to various users. So we, we haven't, we, we have no priority among all these users group. So we have to consider the general public, of course, the educator, educator, or the students, or some people are keen about the disaster recovery information from all these things, and the more professional users with a digital humanities background. So right now, up to now, we haven't restrict or the, put the special focus on uh, either of these uh, user group, but eventually I will, we will expect some group is stands up and the, they have more feedbacks to improve our uh, services. <clears throat> the, so right now we have collected uh, 21 million metadata from 118 database and through the 24 aggregators. So it, it, if you are interested to see the actual uh, institute or data, met, metadata things, uh, collectors, uh, please refer to this uh, page. And the, from here, I will just briefly uh, discuss with the how, what's the, uh, what kind of scheme of uh, common properties uh, mapping uh, to, to collect the metadata. So traditional method like European or other things are pre prepare some standard metadata schema and you try to map them, map the all participant metadata into one. But the, here we adopt the we are, we have picked some field as a, a common properties and we try to map for that part only. And the rest of the field, rest of the metadata information we keep as original and the, just add them. And the, so the common feature for search function is, is heavily used this common properties, but not the structure of the rest of the metadata. So that's the a little bit different approach, I believe. So using that things, we the data providers has been uh, the metadata from original uh, institute is uh, cooked and converted to the uh, this kind of information, and later we uh, Japan Search itself publish this information, this uh, partly normalized information using LDF scheme. And these, okay. <clears throat> so the concept, uh, the, the idea we try to deliver, designed our service of Japan Search, we focus on three activities, the search, the use and enjoy. And the, <clears throat> So, of course, the search function, it could be a basic, the very uh, crucial one. So, of course, uh, not, not only we provide a universal uh, cross, cross database search, but also we provide uh, some customized version of search function. So you can easily cook the what type of information you are searching or what type of field your search 
uh, should be. So it's a kind of uh, uh, not the facetting of the search result, but the facetting of the search function. You may, you can understand. And for enjoy, we provide a gallery or the function of editor to provide that. At using a, a kind of a collection, a meaningful collection of uh, distributed, contributed information and as uh, one uh, collection of uh, information. And through visiting this page, the user can realize, oh, what, how variety we have collected and so the value of those variety is, uh, is not trivial. Okay. So we also provide a note function to customize the collection of that uh, for use abilities. So we, we can collect, uh, our service has host this kind of uh, note uh, to redistribute among users. And also we use this function for a workspace, uh, workspace community results or the uh, project space, which are not necessarily the open to public, but the limited uh, group of people can use this function for their own uh, crucial information without opening up. So that's uh, the basic things uh, we covered. So few future plans, we need to familiarize the public to the public. Uh, Japan search is how useful and empower users and partner communities. Maybe we need to deliver some kind of uh, <clears throat> grade up to the outside uh, users for that using uh, this basic function of Japan search and expand scope of corporate cooperation for local digital resources is, uh, is of course necessary. We have decided uh, three years extension of our committee. So we are now uh, discuss, start discussing how, what kind of strategy should be, uh, should be necessary to, to expand our scope. So organize a community responsibility for common schema and metadata which is, uh, it is not trivial. So it, for example, the news group, newspaper group or the uh, special collection of metadata, we need uh, the careful special design for the metadata for them. And the, for those discussions, uh, NDL team is not uh, suffering suffice to provide a sol solution. So we need a collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, structure to among these uh, people. So I think we run out my time. So as a final sheet, we um, add this one. And this is uh, Cultural Japan, which is a new new service which are independent formally independent from japan search but heavily use the japan search function and also uh, which covers uh, digital new z and europeana and dpla to collect the japan related information more international way and provide a similar function for japan search or even more so that's the if you have any question or further inquiries, please send us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for all our speakers. Um, apologies to Fiona and Mark. I said some absolutely lovely things after you'd spoken, but I'm pretty sure nobody heard them. Um, so can you hear me this time, Carlotta? Give me a nod. <laughs> yes, yes. Super. Okay. It's absolutely fantastic for us as the project team to hear what you guys have 
been developing and are sparking off all sorts of ideas about how we think about the future. Um, but I'd like to maximise the time on uh, questions from the participants here. Um, Carlotta, how are we doing on any submitted questions? We have three questions for now. So one is for uh, Akihito, is for Japan Search. So we can start with this about metadata. And it's Karen Sayers is asking, uh, what type uh, of metadata does the material or method category harvest for the search interface in Japan Search? It's a very technical question. So perhaps if you need more elaboration, we can ask Karen to, to elaborate. Yes, actually, we, we haven't limited the, the type of variety of metadata. We are, as long as the aggregator agreed, they sent us the original form. So, but for our service, we limit that common part for sophisticated search functions, but rest of the things is, is added as a descriptional, more uh, descriptional information for, for those items. So I, I, I'm, I don't know I'm clear enough, but <laughs> So that's common part and rest of the part. And the rest of the part, the, the participant the institute has uh, full freedom to send us. Thank you. We have a question for Mark. Um, it's about building up trust. So what you were saying about, uh, it was a very interesting part. And so Wendy Andrew, Andrews is asking, if, uh, um, if you can say more about how you are building trust, what kind of strategies and activities uh, you're using to do that? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Wendy. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, in the, in, when I was sort of researching um, our approaches in recent times, I, I look back as to what the library had done re um, previously. And there were literally files of letters that have been written by the national librarian or the chief librarian out to various um, people, but they were normally um, introducing themselves and saying, we're, inter we're interested in your collection. Um, but that was when the focus was very much on building a collection of the, of, of, of the noteworthy and of the already kind of um, known um, people in New Zealand. And so now the approach is, is quite different. There's a few strands to it. Um, uh, one is about using our, our exhibition and our access functions. Um, we're, we use the space in the National Library now for events, for talks, for family days, um, and for exhibitions that um, uh, in some part and it's part of our deliberate program to, to target aspects of New Zealand society that wouldn't normally know that a national library exists or, or, or that a collecting in, institution exists or what they do. Um, so um, we have sort of embarked on a, um, it's been a priority for a few years now actually to, to have events that sort of bring people to the library Right, um, and that's a way of establishing connections, and then and then you go from there. Um, but still, that's very much sort of limited on people coming to us. Um, um, we are getting better, and some people um, in our profession are, are, are better than others at doing this. But um, 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 introducing ourselves, sending an email, and saying, "Hey, um, this is who we are. Can we come and talk?" and um, and going to um, the um, uh, the annual meetings of associations of, of interest groups and just saying who we are and what our interest is. Um, a, a sort of key um, element of the, of the messaging around that is not necessarily that the National Library wants to take your memories and take, put them into our, into our big repository and look after them, um, but more so that we're just interested in, the, uh, in ensuring that the right kind of stories are being um, protected and held and available for use into the future. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they come to the National Library. There was a shift in focus in the collection policy as well. So um, when we've engaged with um, a new community group or whatever, um, part of the, of the strategy is also 
you don't have to deposit anything anywhere, but do you want some advice or some training or some follow-up on how to look after that, that collection yourself? Um, how do you uh, to, to support to ensure that you're um, um, looking after uh, retaining the right information through time to A, for your own purposes, but, but B, so that the work you do is able to be, to be known later. Um, so that's part of the strategy as well. Um, and the other is just using the network of people that we know for introductions. Um, and, um, um, and, and as I said, that's, this stuff takes time. It's, 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 it's proper strategy and it's not gonna bear fruit potentially for, um, for many years, maybe even decades. Um, and so um, I think it's quite important to sustain the culture within the library and the strategy within the library where we're where, where develop and um, working for and building relationships for the long term is just a natural part of what we do. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky business and um, I, I hope that answers your question, Wendy. And there's a sort of a follow-up question about, again, public and, uh, and digital and Z. So Richard Light is asking, Mark or Fiona, you can answer this. When the NZ public were asked what data digital NZ should collect, did you get any surprises from the responses? Kia ora. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, I just want to check, are you talking about who, who we should be the collections we should be pointing to, or was it my reference to the voting tool? Um, I'll speak to both. So, so I, in I, terms well, of I, I, sorry, I, I got Go the ahead, impression that there was a, an open call as to what data you should actually be collecting, and um, maybe I misunderstood that. But um, so, you know, the whole question of what should we be recording is, you know, a really big one for our community. So when you actually asked the public, I was fascinated to know what they came back with. Yes, yeah, so in that example, it was uh, asking the pub public what, what should be digitised. And it was a voting tool where they would identify things to be digitised and then people would vote for it. Um, so, yeah, there were a few surprises there. But, but then also it was more about people not understanding the challenges of copyright. In terms of data and collecting what we should be pointing to and collecting, um, we just tried to point to everything we can and work with the widest range of content par partners possible. So um, we, we're not limited to the glam sector. We work with charitable organisations, whoever has digital content that relates to New Zealand, including international organisations. So if anyone out there has New Zealand content in their collections, we could be talking with you. So I haven't, I haven't really answered your question, but um, then again, maybe I have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question again related to the principles, uh, I guess, behind these these projects, and this one is for Japan Search. Um, Jen Ross, would you like to ask a question, or would you want me to to read it out loud? It's the. Uh, uh, I'm, I'll just see if I can get my. Um, yeah, it's working. Yeah, you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I was just. I found the um, the comment that the value of variety is not trivial to users to be really interesting. And I wondered, um, Akiko, did you, did you consider that this was an underpinning principle for Japan Search, um, or is it more of an effect of the approach that you took? If you see what I mean. Yeah, actually, yes. Our approach, I really, I, <laughs> our original approach, I think, that the. That I was inspired, I insist to provide this kind of a gallery contents on top of our site. Because uh, without that, you can just search and the, end up with a very, very diverse results. And sometimes nothing, sometimes uh, tons, of, uh, tons of information from one field, uh, which blind the small, small interesting aspects and, uh, in different fields. So I think we need some kind of editorial process for showcasing the value of our service. So I think I I'm inspired at least by the national 
uh, en Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, BNF, uh, French uh, National Library, provide a Gattaca, which is, the, of course, you know, the encyclopedic approach for sorting the, the value of their collected information. So I think we, we tried, partly we tried to deliver the similar uh, contents to, to prove the value of our service. Thank you, I found that really fascinating. There is a double question by Arianna Chula. So one for NZ and one for Japan Search. So if you would like to ask both of your questions live, otherwise I can read, it up, read them for you. Thanks, I can do that. Um, thanks to both speakers and also to the organizers. Very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, my first question is about um, capability, really. Um, if you could say more about the expertise behind the Digital New Zealand. And I think um, Fiona at least hinted at some some point about the issue of under-resourced services. So I wonder if you could say more about the challenges um, around uh, not only designing, developing, but also maintaining these, these national collections and the digital infrastructure behind it. And then for the Japanese search speaker, um, the question was more about the, again, you kind of answered already um, uh, replying to others, but about the Europeana model, you mentioned that you adopted that. So I wanted to know a bit more about what you meant by that. Is that about the, the common metadata model or the um, specific RDF schema that you adopted or is more in general about the architecture for the, for the infrastructures? Thank you. Shall I go first? Uh, thanks for the question, Ariana. So yeah, challenges in, uh, around resourcing. So I was referring to some rather austere years that we had um, in the middle of the, the teens, the 20 teens, uh, where we were not able to invest quite as much as we would have liked to to keep um, innovating and, and really making a space where we could be helping organisations across the country to innovate with their collection data. So I guess what I was trying to say is that if you're doing some stuff and you're wanting to keep it going, make sure that you've got some certainty of funding along the way. Um, is that answering your question? You talk about capability as well and expertise. Uh, you, do you mean? Yes, yeah, so I, I think I, I basically just wanted to hear um, maybe a bit more about the importance indeed of those, those experts behind these, these resources and, and the stability of, of that expertise to ensure that, that yeah. the that these things keep going in a way and are alive and, 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 and are yeah. produced with quality behind it. Yeah, so having a core team, so based out of National Library of New Zealand, so National Library took a lead and um, received the funding for setting up Digital New Zealand and then running it and then it's become an ongoing service, but making sure that it has the investment that it needs to run the team behind it. So in terms of the expertise within the team, um, metadata harvesting, we work with a develop, an external development company to help with the, um, the development of the front end, but also the back end as well. So rather than having in-house development, we work with a, a company that we've actually been working with for a very long time. So technically they're a remote team, um, but within the team we have systems expertise, metadata harvesting expertise um, to run Supplejack and also community management which is, of course, very important to build to build the, the um, engagement with the service because value is in the use. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for asking. And uh, I mean the Europeana style or similar to Europeana is the only the structure of the collecting information. So aggregation structure is is I, we learned from uh, Europeana because our team at NDL is rather small and the, we have no plan to expand that large. And uh, so we need to how, to, how to manage the scales of the blows up of the participating institute. So we need to provide a structure 
in the beginning, from the beginning, we need to ask the structure for the aggregation and for the collecting, um, for collecting metadata. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from uh, our YouTube follower. He's asking, what have been, to, to either, to any of you, what have been the biggest non-technical challenges to enable the cross-collection discovery? Has it been the usual resources, time, trust? Can you comment on this? Who would Any like to go first? <laughs> Can we have a volunteer? <laughs> I'm just thinking um, the challenges. Uh, it is getting the organizations to put their time aside to work with us to try and make sure that we are um, representing their data in the, the way that they want to. So it's the, it's the collaboration basically. Um, so we can we can work at a certain pace to try and do the technical side of things, but it's actually working with people um, and organizations to show what the value of including your information and your content and the service and why it's a good thing and then um, and then getting them to do QA and those sort of things. So it's it's time and telling them the story and showing the value of what they're doing, what we're doing. Could I come in with a question, Carlotta? Yeah, sure. Um, a big part of our Towards a National Collection program is about funding research into how collections can be brought together and exploring all different methodologies and ways of engaging with the public. So that's been that's very key for us at this underpinning stage of uh, thinking about the future. I wondered from uh, your projects whether you had had a similar stage of um, research, not just within the practitioner teams putting it together, but in partnership with the academic communities? Um, I can maybe address that. Um, firstly, by saying we very much look forward to your research and learning from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't been great with that, to be honest, in terms of, um, of research. There's been bits and pieces around the place, but um, I think um, sort of Fiona mentioned the sort of austere funding that we've had both both centrally in New Zealand, but across the country in recent times. It's unfortunate that research seems to be one of the things that goes first. Um, um, but um, if you look on the the National Library webpage, there's um, there's a, there's a there's a section on 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 research reports, and there were some things that were done sort of uh, around five or so years ago that that I think still um, um, provide quite a lot of interest into the value of the work we do and some of the issues in um, um, building communities and um, engaging with collections. One was um, called uh, Korero Kitia, and that was um, a research project that looked about what happens, how are people using digitized um, te reo Māori collections, so digitized indigenous language collections from New Zealand. And the idea there is that we were finding out what was going on outside of the sort of access point. Um, it's one of the particular sort of interest areas of mine is that um, from within our sector, we often very much focus on access and then don't really know what happens um, with our collections, how they're used, um, the extent to which they're shared, what kind of difference they're making in people's lives. Um, and so it was an idea to sort of to have a look at that. And um, we then found some um, pretty strong connections to macro government policies and the Māori language strategies in, in New Zealand. So uh, there's also research on um, understanding the needs of the, of, of the wider uh, GLAM sector on collecting born digital um, and um, and, and the needs there and how we can best sort of service that. Um, what's traditionally happened in New Zealand is that when an institution who's got some uh, sort of starting to take that, that journey on collecting born digital, maybe it's a photograph collection or something, they come to the National Library or a large institution and say, can you help us? And we've tended to, or we used to, tend to like send them our specs and send them our process docs and say, 
here you are, this is what we do. And it's really incomprehensible to a lot of institutions around the country who may be, you know, a small team or one or two people. Um, so we've put a whole lot of training in place now to, to support that. And that was, a lot of that came out of the research that and what the, what the needs were. Um, I can't quite remember some of the other research projects that have been in place. Some was around digitization priorities, et cetera. So um, that's a long way to say there hasn't been much. There used to be a little bit, but there's, there's, there's not much. And we really don't have a research program in place. Um, so I'd be very much interested in learning from uh, towards a national collection as to what the research program is and how it's progressing once you get, once you get cracking. Great. Well, we, we do have teams who've been working for the last uh, year, including one on Born Digital. I think Kaya's on the call I spotted, so I'm sure she'll be interested to, if she hasn't seen your reports already to be passing them on to the, the PI. Um, back to you, Carlotta. Yes, we have another question from YouTube, and this is uh, it applies to both, since you both have very extensive partnerships. Uh, did you have any partners withdraw previously given data? And I'm guessing the follow-up question will be, what do you do? Uh, how did you face that? We've had one, uh, and it was related to copyright, basically. Um, one, what we did in order to be able to bring thumbnails to display thumbnail images is defined thumbnails as metadata within our terms, the way that we, the, the terms that we have with our content partners. So we have a letter of agreement that um, says, this is what we're gonna do with your data. Um, and and you will, we want you to allow us to display a thumbnail because seeing a thumbnail of an image to be a, is going to have a much, be, be a much better discovery experience. And one partner um, challenged that and decided that was too risky for their organization. Just the one, no one else has had that problem. And, um, in order to, to deal with that, we have an agreement that if someone's not happy, we will just no, we'll just remove them from the, the search um, index and not make them available anymore. And then we've worked with that partner to try and work out what are their parameters for keeping their content, um, their metadata still involved. Um, yeah, so not many at all. And we haven't had much prob m many problems with people misusing the data or the content in any way either. Um, but this one partner was a little more ri risk averse around the what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and their, their interpretation of copyright. Professor Takano, would you like to? Yeah, yeah for Japan Search, uh, I as. As far as I know, there's no uh, such withdrawal uh, database. But the, um, some of the database we have discussed informally before we put into service, uh, they, I, I expect they are delivering the much more larger thumbnails and uh, informations, but the, in the process of discussing to and, and the signing up the contract, they review the state of their copyright things, and the as a result, they uh, stop delivering those. Uh, they decided not to deliver those information. So I think it's a similar uh, situation as Fiona case. Do we have time for one more question, Rebecca? Uh, yeah, if you do one more, and I'd like to do a final one, if I can. Okay, there's a, a Natasha Hudson. I don't know if you'd like to ask your questions about uh, the strategies in place uh, for Digital NZ for reaching the communities that have not traditionally participated. Yeah, I? I mean, I think in, in part, possibly, Mark just answered that slightly, but I just wanted to know how they would deal, I mean, obviously, in creating a national collection, how do you deal with technological inequalities? Uh, especially in the user end, you know, making sure that people do have access to these things. And is there, you know, do you have specific strategies for reaching certain communities? I'd be interested. That's a great question, Natasha. And I, I can speak to it, particularly from the Digital Pacific example that I 
covered off, uh, which is it's kind of like digital New Zealand, but for the Pacific, uh, what it doesn't fully address the issue, but what we made sure that we did is design the interface and the experience to be able to be accessed on 2G, mobile phone 2G, and to be as light as possible and to be, we took an eco-friendly design to the interface as well. So that Pacific communities in the Pacific and the very widest Pacific would at least be able to see the site and interact with it if they had data and enough connectivity. The harder nut to crack is, of course, those that don't have the data and connectivity and how we can get through to that. And that's you know, a, a bigger strategic issue around digital inclusion. Um, but um, another thing we do with Digital New Zealand is work very closely with schools and school librarians. In the National Library, we have, uh, we're quite unique in that we have a whole branch of the library which is responsible for supporting school libraries and school librarians and, and schools with um, accessing resources and, and information and designing online information in a way that it will meet the curriculum and support teaching and, and learners. That's great, thank you. Um, so I'd just really like to make the most of the speakers we've got here today um, for our future program. I wonder whether each of you would be willing to say whether you've done something wrong. In other words, what should we avoid doing? What have you tried that's failed that we should stay away from? And perhaps on a more positive note to finish, what's your one key piece of advice for us going forward? Anyone willing to take that one on? Um, I'll start. Um, great question. I'm not sure if it's something that we've done wrong. It's just um, sort of observations that we are sort of making now that we're starting to embark on a similar journey to you. And it was a place we were at kind of 12 to 12 to 15 years ago and, and sort of looking at the void in between <laughs> that happened. And, um, I guess it's a recommendation is to um, just to encourage you to uh, invest in um, uh, collaboration at a leadership level. Um, I, I know there's times and I'm, we're only just sort of realizing it now when we see the leaders of our national institutions, um, including the sort of larger institutions up and down the country be together, talk about things, talk about their strategies, talk about the value of working together. And um, I, I really do honestly think that that filters down um, um, throughout throughout our, our GLAM sector. Um, so I would encourage you to, as part of your program, to invest in understanding what collaboration is um, and, and how best to sustain that. Um, um, both within your program and beyond it. That is um, excellent and incredibly timely piece of advice for us. Thank you. Professor Takana, what shouldn't we do or what must we do? Yeah, uh, because we are, our activity is still very young. So I, I think there's no not to do not to do task <laughs> in the <laughs> recommendation, but it's. Uh, I think we 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 still have a difficulty to mix the existing community from museums and libraries or the archival documents, and they are very strict principles of themselves. And to mix the metadata, it is sometimes very convenient, but they, they are very reluctant to change their way of thinking or the collect information or the mix them up. So I think uh, we are not successful yet, but it's, uh, I hope we can push back all these collected information to their site, to their collections, to enrich their collection of information. Through that way, we, I believe, we have a nice way to massage their stick and hard <laughs> thinking for more, uh, 
freeway, freestyle way. So that's my recommendation or my dream to realize. Thank you. We shall join you in your dream. Fiona, you've been um, with Digital Search longer. Is there anything you're willing to admit you wouldn't do again? <laughs> um, yeah, I can think of several things. I'm just working out what to share with you. Um, I touched I touched on something actually when I was talking, and that was how easy we've made it for our partners to participate, which has been has had lots and lots of benefits for us because we've got we've been able to get the scale and get a very wide range of content um, and metadata into the system. But at the same time, it's been very easy for people to forget that they're part of us. And so we're not maintaining that buy-in and that sort of collective community that we could have with our content partners. And, and I think we could and should have been doing, could and should be doing a bit more to build that community. So it's getting, getting the investment that into the engagement not only with people using the site but also the community that's part of that site as well um, and then the other thing was around the terms for data so I talked about us being a little bit ahead of the game so we were um, we were ahead of Europeana and others when they were pulling together what an API looks like and how how you manage the data licensing so we were we took quite a, a conservative approach where we said the, data, the metadata can only be used for non-commercial use and then there are, it's a bespoke license so to speak rather than us being able to go for a, a creative commons license so I look very jealously at Europeana and their CC0 licensing for data and the fact that they got their partners on board with that um, at that time because there was more buy-in with that approach by then but that was a matter of timing rather than a mistake um, and and you know we, we're still trying, but we we are we are where we are. Fantastic! Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone else who asked questions that you didn't. Sorry, that put questions in the chat that you didn't get to ask. I hope you'll forgive me for um, seeking a bit of advice uh, for our program. I'm sort of feeling an international support group coming on for everyone working in this area. So uh, we'd certainly be delighted if we could um, keep in touch with you. And maybe next time we'll be the ones on the unsociable hours, and you can you can look a bit uh, happier. So I'm going to have to draw it to a close because. A little bit over time so I'd just like to thank hugely our speakers for sharing their experience that's been fantastically interesting um, as Carlotta said this is the start of uh, a series of seminars looking elsewhere in the world um, for ideas for for our new support group um, and uh, we'll be announcing soon um, the next uh, projects and programs that will be available to uh, speak to you all. We also just wanted to take the chance today to quickly plug um, a domestic seminar series, which Colin will put the uh, links in the chat. Our um, foundation projects, our initial set of research projects, have just or are just about to publish their interim reports and they will be presenting those, um, six of our projects will be presenting those in February. And if anyone would like to attend and come and hear more about the detail of what those projects have managed to achieve and what their next steps are, you'd be very welcome. So thank you so much everyone for attending. Um, I wish I had a wee dram to send to all our speakers before you went to bed, you'll just have to imagine it. Um, but thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.